Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to extend my warm welcome to everyone, our honorable speakers, our students, and colleagues. Uh, Dr. Zari will not be uh, coming here right now, but I'd like to welcome Dr. Cox here to deliver his speech, please. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction and beautiful poetry and uh, uh, the, the grandeur of this um, occasion, really, for us. It's a huge honor uh, on behalf of the team that's visiting to your wonderful place, your wonderful country, this fabulous city, and the wonderful people we've already met in these last couple of days. Um, I, I won't say any more because perhaps now is not the time for me to say any further uh, special things, but I've already been, we've already been terribly struck by what's going on and your intent. Without further ado, I will uh, start my talk. It's invidious that I am the uh, first speaker <clears throat> because it's not a scientific talk. It's a very personal talk about a raw subject that we all share, perhaps. And... Um, I'll just start the machinery here, if I may. And we'll launch off. So, Medicine in a World of Limited Resources, <clears throat> it's a slightly ironical title. Um, and thank you for listening to me in English. I'd love to speak Farsi. It sounds very beautiful, but I shall struggle on in my own language. So I'm a professor in Cambridge, but that's not where I started out. I run a laboratory, was formerly in the Department of Medicine in a senior position, and I now am a director of research, very molecular research, but it's not that which I'll be talking about today. That's for tomorrow. I wanted to share with you some personal reflections, as it were, teach, not by teaching, but by sharing. And you can see just how ordinary and how similar, perhaps, many of us are. I am uh, the same age as the National Health Service. <clears throat> um, I'm a National Health Service boy. I won't tell you how long that's been going for in the UK. And of course, it's facing so many problems. But I do prescribe ultra-high cost therapies, extremely costly. And I'll be talking about those tomorrow. But they stress the system and enable me to see it for what it is and how good it can be when you've got a societal sign-up to therapies. Well, the socioeconomic evolution, certainly in Britain, <coughs> over the last uh, while has been uh, quite extraordinary. Um, as you can see, uh, in this last century or so, the life expectancy of women as shown here, born at certain times, has changed enormously. They don't die in childbirth. They die much later. They die after most men, actually. And you can see this huge change in our demography over the last century or so. So it is everywhere. We have privileges from the past. This is my college in Cambridge, where I work. It's a small college, the last of the old colleges we're about 420 years old. It's a very good place where students work and live, but occasionally they run out of resources for their special days, and they have to look to what they can do with those resources. And when they want to put on a simulacrum, a, a similarity, a festival that resembles Venice, they had to flood secretly that beautiful lawn and put boats on it to imitate Venice for a whole festival one day, which they did one night with no resources, um, and the lawns remain perfect afterwards. So we're used to working even in spits of privilege with limited resources. I worked in Cambridge in one of the big laboratories where many Nobel Prize winners were made when I was a schoolboy and afterwards when I was deciding to do medicine. 
and it was a wonderful experience. And there have been 26 Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology from Cambridge alone. It's a very grand and inspiring place for a practicing doctor with research pretensions. But I went to the University of the Streets by choice. Uh, it was a good place to go. I went to a poor part of East London, shown here practically at the time I was doing my medicine in Whitechapel, which was, of course, a home to immigrants from all over, quite close to the city of London. And uh, the Lombard Court represents the immigrants in that part of London from basically Central Europe and the Italian region later they migrated and ran the Bank of England for quite a few years in some luxury. There were many other visitors, either forced to leave, like the Huguenots, or other groups. There were synagogues, actually. Uh, there are mosques now. There are churches. There are Protestant churches. There are all sorts of divisions in that area. And now, in the bottom corner here, you can see, it would be awfully good if the lights could go down off the stage, actually if that could happen. But now, there's the city of London at the back. This is the east end of London. Now, uh, a very different population. Many people from Bengal and so on. Anyway, in 1971, when I was a newly qualified doctor on the professorial medical unit with a very famous professor as my boss, I saw uh, many patients who had been forced out from East Africa because Idi Amin, a great dictator at that point, had uh, made sure that people from Uganda were no longer welcome, those that had already come from India, largely. And there were some terrible things going on at that time. I was working on a renal unit, and I had a patient. There I was, a young fellow, and uh, I faced a young woman. She was just 22 years old. She was in the East End, but from Uganda just a few months before, struggling with her family to try and make a new life. But she developed symptoms of renal failure, and uh, she had a diagnosis of a simple disease, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. The social reporter came back because there was dialysis available for her. She was just 22 very clever young lady, and she was visited, the family was visited, and it was decided that she was unsuitable for hemodialysis. We saw a special report, bureaucratically typed, and six weeks later, I held her hand as she died of the consequences of untreated renal failure. I haven't seen it since quite like that. I, I thought this was very wrong and arbitrary. If you were lucky in 1971 where I was working, because it was a special renal unit, you would have hemodialysis. And you might even be listed for one of those rare transplants if you had a suitable donor. If you were in India, for example, at that time, one third of those with renal failure would actually get uh, hemodialysis in a country that we regarded as very economically challenged. That's in Gujarat picture at the time. But not so in Britain, where things had already changed. Not so at all. It was pretty dire. And I began to wonder what medicine was all about, because I'd learned an awful lot about the classification of renal diseases. But our great clinical teachers told us what it was like to be a physician. Being a physician involved that you would uh, involve certain principles, that you would be able to cure sometimes. Turns out you can't cure very much apart from certain things in inflammatory and infectious diseases, and the surgeons have the right to cure sometimes. To relieve often, yes, to be with your patient and relieve their symptoms. In those days, we had morphine and bicarbonate, and not a huge amount else. We weren't so sure about the carbonate, bicarbonate. But to comfort, always, to stay with the patient. Very few doctors today are with the patients when they can't do anything for them. They feel lost. Because we can usually try and do 
quite a lot. In those days, there was nothing we could do for that young lady, rejected, I think, on rather horrible grounds, so-called economic grounds. And of course, at the same time, you learn very quickly never to follow any dogma without consideration of your own. The General Medical Council, which is one of the bodies that sets out the duties of a doctor, sets them out very explicitly. They're listed here. Make sure you take care of the patients as your first concern. That's your duty, not to serve the public health economy necessarily, the patient in front of you, and so on. The duties of a doctor are often in conflict with the reality around you, as we all know. But they're set out there almost as religious principles but ones that everybody is obliged to sign up to in the UK, not from Hippocrates, but distilled in the modern world. Medicine in a world of limited resources. Well, what are those limits? What are the resources? Well, the condition itself, um, the disease, there are many diseases today, intractable. We all know that in many countries today, Cancer, for example, is um, you know, still a major cause of death, stroke, coronary heart disease all over the world, and so on. These are not conquered yet. The level of disease is important. Yourself, of course. Your resources, your knowledge, your experience, your skills, your character, the community you come from, find yourself in and work with. The setting physical, social, emotional, the relatives, the expectations, and the equipment, your instruments, the Dallas machines, the drugs ever-changing, the communications. Good doctors, I would say, definitely hunt in packs, not on their own. Now, the limited resources are something worth thinking about because the estimates of the world gross domestic product have been looked at and estimated over a very long period, actually, in about a million or more years of our human history. Some economists have tackled this. <clears throat> What's very clear is that in our countries, things have changed a great deal in the last 100 years or so at an exponential rate of achievement. Since technology, power, communications, and so on, have exploded the capacity to cooperate, to understand, and to have a common purpose. It's astonishing, really. So the limits on the resources of medicine, well, are fading, and let's hope they keep fading. Now, when we look at the gross uh, domestic product of countries fairly contemporaneously, as shown here, well, there are some familiar things. There's um, the United States, there's China, there's Japan. There's, this is Europe here. The, you, you, you can just about make out the UK. Iran is in here, um, India and Japan and so on. Uh, they're very large sums of notional money, money being in a set essence, an article of faith between human beings, quite civilizing abstraction. So that's figures from the World Bank. I hope it's reliable. And then we look at the leading risk factors for health, <clears throat> for disability, for example, as shown here. And I don't know if you can see these images. It looks rather out of focus for me, and I'm Sorry about that. It's a great shame, these, <laughs> if you can't see them. But um, childhood underweight is top of the list, and it's included in middle income and low income uh, uh, countries, as you can see there, judged by GDP, gross domestic product. Um, but it's even there in the high income families and countries. Certain lifestyle phenomena and practices, there's alcohol there, there are other behaviors up there. Uh, unsafe water is number four, and so on. 
So these are leading risk factors for disability by income. And leading risk factors by mortality are also listed. And top of the list, right across all countries, low, middle, and high income is high blood pressure. Very familiar subject. Tobacco use is number two. High blood glucose, number three down there, physical in inactivity. These are all familiar and been spoken about to some extent yesterday. Nine out of 10 child deaths due to malaria and AIDS occur in Africa. Half the child deaths due to diarrhea and pneumonia, which are all too frequent, are in Africa. The leading cause of death in low-income countries are pneumonia, as we heard yesterday, followed by heart disease, diarrhea, HIV, AIDS, and stroke. The director of the Wellcome Trust is here, one of the largest medical charities, if you will, in the world. He traveled all over and will know these facts uh, in common parlance every day. The leading cause of death in the impoverished high-income countries is heart disease, followed by stroke lung cancer, pneumonia, asthma, or bronchitis. Men between 15 and 60 have a greater risk of dying than women at the same ages. And now, of course, through conflicts everywhere, we are seeing uh, violence and conflict, and that's pitching up everywhere with a bias towards certain countries, which you could guess. Depression is the leading cause of disability in many countries, in high-income countries particularly, 50% more frequent in women. Alcohol, overuse and misuse and use is among the 10 leading causes of disability. Here are infant mortality figures shown worldwide. In red, we're seeing the very severe deaths. We're talking about, um, well, 120 to 140 per thousand the population. And you can see where these are to be found um, in these years here, to 2015. This was published in The Lancet in 2016 in the, uh, the, the global uh, uh, burden uh, of disease, a wonderful series uh, compiling a huge amount of work. So you can see that certainly sub-Saharan Africa, parts of the Far East and so on. We often now realize that income and inequality are the iniquities, really, of human civilizations. And there in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, you can see uh, rather shabby accommodation, the poor favelas. You can see here a luxury sports ground and luxury accommodation set out overlooking it all, a common sight worldwide. And this little girl here in Delhi, seven years old, picking her life, particularly little girls in certain parts of the world, underrated, left, orphaned, struggling, picking through the garbage. These are familiar images to many of us and are terrible things that we must all face. So inequality is one thing. But the socio-demographic index has been found to be a great predictor of performance, if you will, in mortality, intervenable mortalities. And this is based on an estimate, a composite, loved by statisticians now, of average income, educational attainment, and total fertility rate, reflecting a level of independence, education, and so on, of control, uh, particularly by young girls and women. A great Nobel Prize winning and Cambridge graduate and uh, master of Trinity College in Cambridge um, has published a lot and is very much read here, as you can see in this translation of one of his books on inequality, Amartya Sen, a great man who's contributed to a textbook which uh, uh, Professor Conlon and many others and Professor Worrell in this audience have contributed, uh, have edited and so on. Income inequality across the world. Well, it's not good, is it? Um, these are figures declared in 2014. 
and uh, they represent a familiar, slightly old-fashioned index, the Gini coefficient, either given as a percentage up to 100 or up to 1 fractions. And this uh, Conrado Gini was a, uh, an Italian who made a calculation for the distribution of wealth by decile factors throughout a population. So the Gini coefficient, in a sense, is 1 when all the country's wealth, the population's wealth, is in the hands of one person, and zero if it's uh, uh, in everyone's. And it's a distribution simply calculated here as you go up to the percentages. I'm sorry this is out of focus if it, if it is, and I'd be awfully good if it was focused, but I don't think we could do anything about that. Anyway, the high values you can see are often in poor places. Um, here we have Brazil, here we have parts of sub-Saharan Africa, and strangely, this very rich country has a huge disparity between rich and poor, as we know, and so does this one, and so does that one. In Europe, um, it's not completely heterogeneous either, and blue is uh, a little bit too much disparity, and uh, the paler colours of the richer countries, for example, per head of population in Scandinavia, where um, the way things are done politically involves sharing and less difference between rich and poor. And it's regional, even within the microcosm of where we come from. But those differences are fairly small overall. But what's quite clear about the Gini coefficient, which has been improving with retrospective calculations for some terribly clever econo economists since 1820, as you can see, um, here it's getting worse, reaching a maximum of about 0.7 in 2002, and beginning to go down after that, up to recent history. So it's had peaks of inequality as the world's wealth has grown, but it's being leveled out in some of those big countries that have recovered and have very defined health and uh, distribution of equality of, of resources plans. And this doesn't always quite correspond now to our estimates or predictions for mortality and illness. So the Gini coefficient is very easily swayed by a very high birth rate, or as in certain countries, for example, Japan and Italy and certain parts of Europe, where there's a big, an aging population, which leads to a, 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 a funny distribution of resources through other means. So we really want to develop the idea of inequality, but perhaps not measure it uh, as, as we did. You see, it doesn't work in the UK. Now, the wonderful uh, man that we know, Mahatma Gandhi, first great leader of modern India, a great man, said that a nation's greatness is measured by how it treats its weakest members. I think many of us, as doctors anyway, would sign up to that. And when you look at income inequality and mortality, for example, in the UK, this is mortality in women, uh, men and women. Uh, the, the women are, are in blue here. And this is set, I can tell you the numbers. Uh, this is deaths per 100,000 population in time here from 1962 to 1990. You can see that it is falling. People are living longer. Mortality is going down. But actually, the, the Gini coefficient is going up quite markedly with the maldistribution of wealth, I'd say. So it's not really reliable. We need something better. And the SD, uh, SDI, the Social Democratic Index that I mentioned, appears to be more relevant. Here with India, you see what we learn, for example. More people have a mobile phone than have a toilet in the world. Probably an iPhone, actually, and all those other media things. This is quite astonishing. So we find it very difficult to clean up an unsanitary world. 2.4 billion people, very recently, as I said, last year, lack adequate sanitation by all standards. 
and one billion relieve themselves in the open regularly, or I hope regularly. And this is an astonishing thing for provision of simple resources of water. So the social demographic graphic index and life expectancy, capturing those elements of development, income, education, and fertility, proves in many cases to be a great predictor in males and females over time. So we see here uh, on the bottom the index and we see how it rises and how it predicts in males and females for life expectancy at birth, death rates uh, before the age of five. The next one down, if you can't see it, probability of death between 15 and 50, probability of death between uh, 50 and 70. There are some exceptions. Here are men suddenly at this time here in those countries. Well, I'm afraid this is conflict and some parts in the world where you would know where conflict is occurring. Violent death for men. And women too, to some extent. But men fighting. And these lead to fatal discontinuities, as you see here, over the time from 1970 uh, to 2015. Deaths due to natural disasters, deaths due to other causes, and deaths due to war in red. And you can see uh, here, let's take this time here, um, <coughs> That was a campaign not, not too far away from here, but not, not here. So there are discontinuities and sudden disasters and bad behaviours. Conflict, colonialism and famine. Amartya Sen wrote a great deal about human disasters and showed that colonialism, and I'm afraid my <coughs> country uh, has been very responsible for lots of colonialism in history, as you now know, when I was born, I'm sort of innocent, uh, but never can you be completely innocent of your country's uh, aggressive colonial history. Colonialism often led to a failure of investment in local resources. And so the great famines, for example, of India, Great Bengal Famine, which was the thing that put Amartya Sen onto his track of particular economic, economics, uh, was, was a significant one. Recent ones in Haiti, for example, disaster. Not just because the countries were poor, but because of the conflation, the cynicism, the lack of infrastructure that was invested or not. Human disasters, a chapter he wrote for the Oxford Textbook of Medicine, actually, is, is a, and written again, is a fabulous, fabulous dissection of this. And it reads, it's tough to read. So those countries with a high socio-democratic uh, developmental index a middle one and a low one, do they do well or do they do badly? And Scandinavia, parts of West Europe and East Africa, actually, with a high SDI, uh, do well. The United States and Russia, I'm not, I, I don't want to sound political, I'm just talking about places, do rather badly in relation to the predictions of that refined index of predictability for outcomes. In the middle SDI per, per, per group, China and Cuba do very well. Communist countries. Guyana in, uh, in north and part of uh, South America does very badly. It's colonial. Um, and then Ethiopia, Niger, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Albania do rather well amongst the low SDI countries, whereas others here you'll recognize. So there are exceptions. The 10 leading factors you now know in those different things are, I told you, high blood pressure in the world, tobacco use and high blood pressure in high income uh, countries. In low income countries, top causes of death intervenable are childhood underweight also high blood pressure, and middle tobacco use, high blood pressure. So the report by Dr. Chris Murray, tremendous progress has been made in global health over the last 25 years, reducing the impact of some major killers like HIV or childbirth, and greatly expanding access to drugs or vaccines to prevent and kill and treat many millions of the poorest people on the planet.
But sustaining that rate of progress from the great improvements that have been seen is getting a lot harder. One way to measure it is to compare health indicators with a country's economic development. And he singled out, actually, and I don't do it for any particular reason, but he wrote it. The United States is still doing quite poorly. And no doubt we are too. So the actual health outcomes compared with those predicted, as I hinted before, are shown here. And uh, the best here is in red. And you can see some colors there for the various regions. And the blue and the dark blue are the worst. They tell you a lot. So over these years, global mortality of 30 years, 35 years, global mortality from 1980 has improved. The mean age of death, let's say the life expectancy of birth, increased from 61.7 globally to 71.8 in 2015. That's quite remarkable. The total deaths in a couple of years ago were about 56 million. Out of a world population, about 7 billion. Much less than 1%. Non-communicable deaths rose. The infections have been, are being addressed, apart from those ones that have been discussed in the teaching yesterday, diarrhea and pneumococcal pneumonia and so on. But in most regions, ischemic heart disease, stroke, diabetes were the leading cause of premature deaths. In Africa, still communicable diseases, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases caused the most deaths, where malaria and AIDS or AIDS remained the leading cause of early deaths, observed far exceeding expected. So sustainability versus stagnation. What do you do about your health budget? I'm not a politician. Politics is about the art of the possible, or perhaps the art of the soluble. So here we are, gross national product percentage you spend in Norway, for example, per citizen, there we are, and what your life expectancy would be at birth. In Norway, to take, they have a lot of North Sea oil, um, it's about $9,700 per person uh, spent Life expectancy, 82 years. Switzerland, 11.5% uh, of GDP. Similar sums, 83 years. USA, 17.1% of a massive GDP. The biggest in the world, of course, still. Slightly under 9,146. A big difference, 79 years. Hong Kong, 6%, only about $1,700 per person per year, 82 years. Israel, for example, 82 years. Singapore, 4.6%, 2500 dollars per citizen, 83 years. Something's gone wrong somewhere in some of the countries. Well, the duties of a doctor, of course, are about advocacy based on scientific understanding. We all know what you've got to do about these things. How do you enact politically a change in lifestyle and health and correct eating and so on? We know. We did the science, us profession. We know what the risk factors are. We have some ideas what causes the mortality, which is saying something. And we advise, don't we, what the health policies should be. And we, it was our discoveries, and it's based on science, on research. Our duties, of course, are to make magic happen and to perform miracles. And at the same time, not just follow the rules. Scientific medicine, of course, which is what we're about and what we're here for and why we're invited, is, does bring about some kind of miracles, if you will, the unexpected to the bedside. For example, in the hemoglobinopathies, genetic diseases which are common, the iron-loading anemias affect, you know, the better part of a million people a year from deaths. Sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, you know about, of course, here. It's not just about transfusion and antimicrobials and splenectomy and immunization and 
heroic bone marrow transplantation and screening, of course, for molecular genetics. Great David Weatherall pioneered this from Oxford many years ago through the World Health Organization. Huge effects in stricken countries with a genetic burden. Gene therapy for the few, but other things too. Increasingly effective, orally active, and now increasingly inexpensive iron collators. And indeed, new discoveries of the active inhibitors in phase three trials, which materially change the structure of the bone marrow and the iron loading drive from understanding molecular basis of iron metabolism and its control in the expanded situation of the erythron. These amazing discoveries that have come out through hard science. And hard science and technology has been in medicine for a very long time and has relieved embarrassment and relieved difficulties in social status. And I was amazed to see that here in Iran, excavated perhaps 10 years ago, was an astonishing thing, which I'm sure you in the audience know about. It was reported only a few years ago in the English uh, language press. Here is a young woman with a prosthetic eye globe here beautifully fashioned out of a resinous material with a mimic pupil, with a filigree here of a design scratched in with gold probably and representing the capillaries of the white of the eye and strapped in, we know that it was held in. Uh, an astonishing refinement for a very privileged woman um, with many great things in her grave. I'm sure you know this, but at first glance, uh, a most extraordinary, delicate thing, and the first discovery and invention. So all human societies have been investigating technology and science for medicine. Coming back to my patient, she could have had a renal transplant. She would have had better immunosuppression. She would have had humanized monoclonal antibodies, perhaps, or antithymocyte globulin, or Tacrolimus, or she would have had wonderful drugs to help her through that successful therapy. You do transplantation in this part of the world for many things. Her, even if she'd been on dialysis, she would no longer have had encephalopathy and uncontrolled hypertension, anemia. She would have had recombinant erythropoietin. She would have had vitamin D analogues to prevent her from getting that skeletal disease, the osteodystrophy, which I remember so well. She would have had calcium emetics. She would have had a better life. She was just born at the wrong time in a miserable setup when medicine was wrong. And that drove me to work personally for rare diseases, even if it was a high cost therapy. How do we prioritize that? And in Britain, we are very utilitarian people. I don't particularly recommend this. We want to give the best treatment for the most people. Politicians tend to like that. Um, once a drug has been approved, it's got to be efficient and good quality and good value for the NHS. And so it's outsourced after approval and marketing authorization. It won't be paid for. The NHS deputes it to something called NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Care and Excellence. I won't say whether it's national. I won't say whether it's an institute. I won't tell you how clinical it might or might not be, and I'm unsure as to exactly how excellent it is, but this gentleman, who I was never particularly fond of, introduced it. A former prime minister, who made a number of decisions, not everybody approved of those, but anyway, this gentleman brought about NICE, which deputed to a body to work out whether or not a treatment would be valued to the NHS. And many efficiency arguments are introduced to get value for money. The arbitrary threshold for the quality adjusted life year is about £30,000 or $50,000. And would you believe it? This arbitrary number comes from the 1980s, the cost, the annual cost of hemodialysis in uh, the UK and America. When everybody introduced hemodialysis by agreement, some kind of consensus across the world, the cost was about that. And that's taken arbitrarily now in the UK to be the quality number that can't be exceeded. Of course, it doesn't work for rare drugs and rare therapies. 
is a double jeopardy for people with rare diseases. And it does presume in a way that I think, I'm not a particularly religious person, presumes to evaluate the quality and value of a human life. So when things go bad, it's the same in medicine as in bad periods of art. When art is bad, good art is suppressed. When art is good, good and bad art flourish side by side. And the man who is the dean of my medical school uh, wrote that. It is the same with medicine. When your society doesn't work things out, medicine is bad. We can try to ration money, but we can't ration people. So I'm going to say that there are difficulties today and finish there. Changing perspectives of medicine. It commands huge resources and is a massive business with economies of nations. And it is globalized, commercialized, politicized. And I would say there is a tendency to deprofessionalize. I use the American English of turning nouns into verbs. Providers serve clients and deliver care, like we deliver education rather than lead out. Public health doctors no longer care for epidemics and sanitation. They commission services. They ration and regulate. And universities and medical schools, certainly in certain parts of the world, are becoming massive businesses that deliver education. Here we're about leading out and giving an example to the future by conquering the societal problems that we all share and wanting to live together and share those principles through medicine, which I think gives us the precepts for a good life. So thank you very much indeed.